The mortgage process can feel like a roller coaster at times. And it can also feel like it's going very fast in the beginning. And hey, this is going to be over soon. But then at the end, it seems like, well, when is this going to end? It's going so slow. They have everything. But you can help make that process go a lot smoother because you are the major participant in the whole mortgage process. And a lot of the stuff that your lender is going to need, the quicker you provide that, the smoother things should go for you. Also, it's about the things that you do. I've seen so many people do so many things to sabotage their transaction or their pro the mortgage process just by their actions. So the things that you do will dictate how smooth or how rough the mortgage process can be. So what I want to do is I want to go through my do not do list. These are the things that I tell every client, every student that they should not be doing these things unless they want to have a rough mortgage transaction and nobody ever does. So we want to avoid these things. First thing is going to be do not change your circumstances. When you apply for your mortgage, however your financials look, however your employment looks, however your credit looks on that day that you applied, you want to freeze it in time and you don't want it to change. There's a lot of little things that people don't think are that important that they do that will make your life a complete nightmare when it comes to getting your mortgage. So do not change your circumstances. That's the most important thing. And of course, and I'll probably say this throughout the video, if you're not sure about something, by all means, contact your lender. Ask your lender before you do something because just the slightest little thing can make all the difference. So do not apply for other credit. Don't go to the department store and save 10% when you go to buy your appliances. In fact, just wait to buy those appliances after you have recorded on the property and you are officially the owner. At that point in time, you're safe. You can basically do whatever you want to at that point. Don't apply for credit that you don't need. Don't buy a car. Don't, uh, don't do anything. Don't, don't get consumer financing. Don't do anything other than the mortgage that you are doing to get this to buy this property don't quit your job i have had people quit their jobs i have had people get fired i had a guy who literally got in a fight at work the week of our closing and got fired and he couldn't buy his house so everybody did a lot of work and then of course nobody uh you know nobody got paid because the transaction didn't close so it's really important to when i say don't change your circumstances it's also about those decisions. Should he have just not gotten into a fight? Whether he was getting a mortgage or not getting a mortgage, he probably shouldn't have been fighting at work. I bet hindsight is 2020 in his opinion. I wish I hadn't gotten into that fight because now I can't <clears throat> buy this house. So it's the little things that really do make a difference. So don't quit your job. Don't do something that's going to get you fired. You don't want to do any of that stuff. It makes, makes a big difference. People ask, well, why did they wait until the very end to verify my employment? Well, they didn't wait till the very end. They actually, your lender will verify your employment up front at the time that they're submitting it to the underwriter who's going to review the entire file and sign off on it. But then they have to do the verification again at the end of the transaction before it funds to make sure you are still indeed employed. So if you quit one day before you're supposed to close, that is likely going to be discovered and that will cause your loan to be denied, even though you have already signed everything, because that is going to be a prior to funding condition in many cases. And, and it is a requirement, um, at least within 10 days of closing under Fannie Mae, that that happens. So you will see your lender verifying your employment at the beginning and then again at the end. So keep that in mind. Do not co-sign. I've had people say, but I didn't apply for credit. I co-signed. Let's set the record straight. Co-signing for somebody on a car, co-signing for somebody on a credit card, co-signing for somebody on a student loan. Co-signing is getting, it is applying for credit. It is credit. And it's going to show up on your credit report as if it's yours. Now it'll have a little J next to it that stands for joint in terms of the fact that you are a co-signer on it, but you suffer the same consequences if they don't pay it. You have that uh, new debt that now has to be counted against you when you qualify. So 
when it comes to how much somebody can be approved for, if, if they're co-signing for another debt, you know, if they're picking up another $200, $300, $400, $500 car payment or some student loans, which I've seen student loans and you know, like $1,000 a month. I mean, it's student loans are, are crazy. That debt is going to count against them in getting a mortgage. So if they do it right before they're going to close on a transaction to buy a house and they're getting a mortgage, and all of a sudden this is discovered right before closing, it could be a huge problem. They basically might not be approved any longer. So do I would say, just as a rule of thumb, whether you're buying a house or not, don't co-sign. You know, I've got a million different stories about people who have co-signed and the regrets and, and the experiences that they've gone through. But definitely during the mortgage process, do not co-sign for anybody. And that would include signing co-signing on a lease as well, just to be on the safe side. Do not shred documents. Use your head before you shred. Don't be that person that shreds everything as soon as they get their mail. Don't shred your pay stubs. Don't shred your W-2s. Don't shred your taxes. Don't shred stock certificates. Don't shred uh, your quarterly retirement account statements. Don't shred your social security card. Ah, I had somebody do that once. Don't shred stuff until you speak to your lender about whether or not this is gonna be needed for your transaction. We live in a world where yes, we do wanna shred things because we wanna protect ourselves from identity theft. But the mortgage process is a process that requires a lot of documentation, a lot of documentation. Some less on different transactions. You don't know until you're done, you know, what, what documentation you might need. There's a lot of things that have to be, be proven. Just ask your lender before you shred anything if, if you are in an automatic shred mindset. Do not deposit cash. There are five good reasons to not deposit cash, but there's one most important thing, and it's, gonna, it's the fact that it's gonna be a problem. But the reasons are this. Number one, your lender has to abide by anti-money laundering uh, laws. So they have to follow a certain protocol to make sure that money, that they know where the money came from. So you deposit cash and that becomes a potential issue. Unless you can document it with a bill of sale, you can try sold something, they have to document where that money came from, if it's a large enough sum. So as a rule of thumb, don't deposit cash. Because of the Patriot Act, that becomes an issue. Once again, another federal law, Patriot Act, where cash deposits could potentially be an issue. The other one is going to be the new Dodd-Frank Act ability to repay rules that went into effect on January 10th of 2014. The lender has to show that this person has the ability to repay this mortgage or that borrower could potentially sue the lender for giving them a loan that they couldn't afford. They are required to meet eight specific underwriting points to show that this person is, is able to make the mortgage payment. And part of that is to verify that the funds belong to you, that they are not borrowed, that they have not been given to you. They want to make sure that this money that is in your bank account has not been borrowed. It can be a gift, but it just can't be borrowed. A gift from a relative or non, it doesn't have to be blood relation. Gifts are allowed in most mortgage programs, but borrowing money for your down payment is not. And even if you don't need the money, don't deposit it into your bank account because it could, it could be an issue. And that varies from lender to lender and from program to program and circumstance to circumstance. So I'm just laying out a broad, um, you know, kind of a broad suggestion of don't deposit cash as a rule of thumb 60 days and beyond before you are going to be closing on a mortgage. That's my suggestion. I'm just trying to make your life easier. And then the last one, number five, is they want to make sure the underwriter, they being the underwriter, the underwriter wants to make sure that the seller hasn't given you cash to induce you to buy this property. That this is a free market transaction, that everything is, is based on what everybody wants to do and nobody is being induced or persuaded to do anything. So those, those are your five main reasons. Three of them, federal laws. Two of them, long time uh, mortgage, mortgage, mortgage guidelines that have always existed. Okay, the next one, don't pay your rent in cash. It's okay if you're at an apartment complex. It's okay if you have a professional licensed property manager who has a real estate license. If you have a third party who can verify the rent and it's an apartment complex or a licensed property manager, 
then paying in cash is probably not that big of a deal unless you have a disagreement and they say, oh no, they didn't pay it on time. Now, really, as long as you pay it within 30 days, that's going to be considered on time for mortgage purposes. But as soon as you pay cash, you lose control. And so if you're paying cash to a homeowner, let's say you're renting a house or you're renting a room, whatever the case may be, if you're paying it directly to the homeowner and they're not a professional property manager, could be an issue because maybe they can't fill out the verification. Once again, it's one of those things that's going to vary from circumstance to circumstance and program to program. As a rule of thumb, if you write a check, you you have control over that. If you're doing an automatic uh, payment out of your bank account, you have documentation. Don't lose control over what you can document by paying cash because that's exactly what happens is you lose control. You can't document that cash transaction. And if somebody wanted to say, they never paid me, I never got that cash, they're lying. They didn't pay their rent for that last month or the month before. If you are dealing with somebody who is inherently evil, they could take advantage of you. And I've had that happen to my students in, cl in classes, that, in first time homebuyer classes that I've taught. I hear all sorts of crazy stories of things that have happened. So don't lose that control. And especially if you live with family members, write a check every single month on the first of the month for the same amount of money each and every time. The reason is the housing payment that you make prior to getting your mortgage, if you can show 12 months housing history, that may not be a requirement, but if you have it, believe me, it makes your transaction a lot smoother. It makes it a lot easier for that lender to say yes to you if they can verify that you have a housing history versus somebody who does not. And somebody who has been paying $500 cash to their parents for five years, they do not have a housing history because they can't document it. Their parents are not gonna be able to verify it because they're an interested party because it's their kid. Just keep that in mind, keep control over it. You wanna have control over being able to prove your housing history. Don't forget to pay your bills. I could bore you for hours of stories about people who have forgotten to pay a $25 minimum credit card payment that has destroyed their transaction. In fact, I will do videos telling these stories because they are so insane and because I lived it. <laughs> when I say don't forget to pay your bills, it's, it's easy for some people, I suppose, to forget. Like, you know, they take the bill, it's a $25 minimum payment, and it's not due for two weeks. They stick it on a table and then somehow it gets shuffled into the junk mail. And the next thing you know, it's being thrown in the recycle bin or it's being thrown in a shredder and it's, it gets forgotten because it's only $25. But if you have a 30 day late on a $25 credit card payment versus say a $2,500 mortgage payment, well, they're both, they're both 30 days late. They're both going to knock the credit score down tremendously. And this can be a huge issue that literally that $25 late payment could potentially keep you from getting your mortgage. That's how important it is. Stay detailed on that. Super important. Okay. Next one. Do not lend out your money. Well, if I'm borrowing money, why would I be lending out money? It sounds ridiculous, right? But I've seen this happen where somebody has money in the bank, they have their money for their down payment, and they have a lot more. They have a lot more left over. They've been saving their money. When I say don't change your circumstances, here's a perfect example. Guy comes to me, I run it through, pull his credit, get the automated underwriting approval because computers approve 99% of all this. Didn't His credit score was not great. He had a foreclosure previously, had a few other things, but his scores had rebounded. He was in about the 660 range and he was doing a VA loan and he was, he was approved, it approved him. It approved him because he had $24,000 in his checking account and it liked the fact that he had a ton of reserves because on a VA loan, you don't have to have a down payment. So really all he needed was just money to close, which the seller could pay. So really, he didn't really need much money at all. And so he had $24,000 that he had saved up sitting in his checking account and the computer loved it. Now fast forward, he didn't buy immediately. He in fact waited about six months and I told him not to change the circumstances, but perhaps I should have expanded what that means. Like what I am doing this in this module. Because what he did, was he, he lent out about 20,000 of that. And so now he only had about 4,000. So he went from having say, you know, 24 months reserves for the mortgage payment. And what reserves means is any amount of money you have left over 
after your down payment, after the closing cost, so after the transaction is, is done, how much money do you have left over? Divide that by how much your monthly mortgage payment is going to be, and that number is the number of months of reserves that you have. And it gets picked up in the automated underwriting, and that could really be the difference between being approved and not being approved. So in his case, he got approved because it loved the fact that he had 24 months reserves. That was absolutely huge. Well, now he had four months or less reserves and it was denying his loan. So that is why I say don't lend that money because he had lent that money to a family member and it caused a big problem for him. Now, did he still get his mortgage? He did because fortunately for VA, it can be manually underwritten. Everything else met the guidelines, but believe me, it's a lot easier when the computer approves you. Now, if he was going you know, with other programs, he may not have been able to be approved. So VA was very good on that. FHA is generally pretty good on that. Conventional, maybe not so much. Like, do, not, do not get rid of the money that you have. Whatever your lender sees at the beginning, they better still be seeing that at the end. Assuming you have your down payment, your closing costs, that's being taken into consideration. Keep in mind, reserves are super, super important. Don't get a collection or a judgment. One of the things that I tell people from the standpoint of what should I do during this process, it's watching for the smoke that leads to fire. If they're getting a call of, hey, we're calling about this collection, you know, this old utility, this uh, you know, old medical debt, whatever. And even though medical debts are gonna be uh, taken out of the equation here in the near future, you know, it's, it's gonna take some time before it filters into the mortgage process. Uh, the mortgage, still using a formula that was released back in like 2008, and now here we are in 2014. So, so don't expect that to be a real fast process. So, I mean, it could be 2016 before the medical collection is removed from the FICO scores. But beyond that, just watch for any clues that something might be going on to that credit report. Because if all of a sudden, let's say that there's an old cable bill that gets put onto your credit report, and that can knock your score down 80 to 100 points. I've seen it happen. I've seen people have a collection at the last minute that derailed their transaction, that absolutely destroyed their transaction. And so they had to wait. Sometimes it can work out and sometimes it does. I literally have some stories that I will be setting down to make a module of that or you can't possibly forget them because of how it, uh, what the outcome was. You know, and so there's no way to know exactly how it's, gonna, how it's gonna be. So you wanna protect yourself. Make sure there's no money out there that you owe, no potential collection that could pop up on your credit report at the end. Because remember how I said the lender is gonna check your, your employment again at the end? They're also gonna check your credit report there at the end. And so if you have a new account that shows up, if you have a new, if there's a collection, if your credit score has, has, has tumbled, stuff like that could still be an issue until you have actually funded and recorded on that house. At that point, you can breathe a sigh of relief. But before then, be very aware of what's going on. Don't forget to file your taxes. In the past year, I have had three clients who literally forgot to send their taxes their TurboTax. They had done them on TurboTax, so they completed them. They actually provided me with taxes that they had printed out. The problem was is the lender has to do a tax transcript request with the IRS as a fraud prevention method and quality control to make sure that what the IRS has in their records matches what is in our records provided by the borrower. So when the IRS comes back and says, we have no record of this borrower or this uh, you know, taxpayer filing their taxes, that's a problem. And literally these three individual separate clients have all done this where they literally forgot. They forgot to hit send. They forgot to actually file the taxes after they completed those in TurboTax. So be sure that you have taken care of that. That is an issue. Uh, it can, it can, you can get past it. There are some ways to kind of speed the process up, but once again, delays at the end, this would be potentially a cause for that. So you want to make sure that you are taking care of that. Do not surprise your lender. Lenders do not like surprises. I have never liked a surprise unless it involves a birthday cake and singing. That's the only kind of surprise I ever want to encounter because surprises, it, oh, I'm starting to get some gray hairs here. Uh, you know, breathing, breathing a little you know, odd over the years in terms of, you know, just 
it's stressful. You know, when people say all of a sudden, oh yeah, I haven't done that. I shredded everything. I don't file my, I haven't filed my taxes in five years. I've done this. All of these things that are going to be a problem. That's, you know, something, something to be aware of. So do not surprise your lender. Your lender does not want to be surprised and you don't want them to be surprised because that could be a potential issue as far as delaying your transaction. Do not hesitate to ask any questions. In fact, always be asking questions. You should be asking questions because you don't do this every day for a living. And for those of us who do, for those of us, whether we're actively originating or in the training sector, whatever the case may be, we see this every single day. There's, I would say in 15 years, I have seen everything, but I would be wrong because every time I start to think that way, I get some new surprise that I never would have imagined. And in fact, in my 15th year in the mortgage business, I had more surprises than my first year in the mortgage business. So it's a constantly learning situation in terms of all the different things that can potentially happen. There's been huge changes um, in the mortgage business and we're gonna continue to see changes. As long as you hold up your end of the bargain and you provide what the lender needs, you pay your bills on time, you, you know, keep your circumstances the way they were when you applied for the mortgage, it should go really, really smooth because I've, some transactions are so easy, I feel guilty being paid on them. But those make up for the ones that I made 25 cents an hour on. So I don't feel that guilty. So ask questions of your lender. So the mortgage process does not have to be brain surgery. It does not have to feel like it's brain surgery. It doesn't have to feel like it's rocket science because it's really not. It is a simple process with a lot of pieces, with a lot of movement and a lot of variables. Best of luck to you. I hope you found this interesting. Watch some of the other modules. The most important thing, just keep on learning.